what I call the agony and the ecstasy of seven figure engagements when you're a small firm, which I think a better title would have been the ecstasy and the agony because the ecstasy comes first, right? The agony comes later. Um, and so I'll walk you guys through what I mean by that. A little bit of background on myself, I'll go through it quickly, but I did my bachelor's at University of Florida, and then I did an internship at GE Healthcare. And that's where I kind of fell in love with medical devices. And then when I went back to UF and got a master's, and then I went and worked for a year and a half at a startup, and that's where I fell in love with entrepreneurship. So I was the third person hired in a company that grew to about 40 or 50 by the time I left. And the, the founders were all serial entrepreneurs who kind of mentored me and, and encouraged me to consider becoming an entrepreneur. So then I went and did my doctorate at MIT, and I would say that I got the academic knowledge of medical devices and entrepreneurship. So I did my doctoral thesis on the development of low power systems for medical devices, and I did my I did a minor in business administration, and I really tried to learn as much as I could about entrepreneurship, but you really don't learn entrepreneurship until you do it, I think. And so right out of MIT, I started a company, which was, was one company, but we had two brands. Uh, Myolex was a medical device for diagnosing neuromuscular disorders. And then Sculpt was more of a consumer brand for um, health and fitness. And I would say that's that was my school of hard knocks for medical devices and entrepreneurship. And it's also where I kind of fell in love with the internet of things, this idea of taking devices, connecting them to the cloud. And you know, this company, I was building it just as IoT was starting to take off. So I got to be there pretty early and, and learn a lot of things. And so then I started Bold Type about seven years ago and I kind of put it all together. So it was medical devices plus the internet of things. And then of course, entrepreneurship, both in the fact that I'm an entrepreneur and in the fact that a lot of my clients or our clients are entrepreneurs. So that's just for background. Um, so then I'll give you a brief history of Bold Type. And you know the way that we've been positioned to date um, has been as like the industry uh, expert developers of connected wireless medical devices. And, you know, it's kind of like a, a shorthand for that would have been medical internet of things. But what we found was that when we started the company, most medical device companies didn't think of themselves as being in the internet of things. So we just called it, you know, kind of more explicitly connected wireless. Um, and, and part of the pitch to our potential clients has always been that, look, these are really difficult products to develop. They require a very diverse set of skills, um, you know, probably around 20 different skills that you need to do this correctly. And so you definitely don't want to go and try to do this on your own if you're if you're a startup or even if you're an established company that hasn't done this before. You want to make sure you bring on um, one or more partners to do that. But before we got to here, I'm going to give you kind of the history. So it started in 2017, and and it really started as an Internet of Things consulting company. And by company, I mean me. Like it was just me. And um, when I when I decided to start the company, I. Uh, was offering kind of fractional CTO services. So I was going to startups and saying, developing this kind of product, sophisticated type of product. Um, I've been in that space for six, seven years. I've learned a lot of lessons. I've scraped my knees, you know, borrow my scar tissue. Don't try to figure this out on your own. And um, I made four phone calls and I landed three clients. And I was like, damn, this is easy. Like, this is going to be, you know, just <laughs> the easiest job in the world. Um, That's cute, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad you interjected, Michelle, because you you began to talk about a a CTO type service for your business. Has that had any traction? I, I'm getting there. So nobody signed a contract yet, but it's because they needed so much more than the fractional role. Like, because I have the the role scope to like kind of normal day to day activities, and they had a whole pile of mess we had to clean up before they could could get there. But it's definitely creating some some conversations I'll, I'll say that like it's getting popular what do you define <laughs> fractional cto just out of uh, curiosity and conceptually isn't aren't most consultants fractional employees kind of sometimes yeah i think oftentimes and for me like when i was going to these companies i was like you're about to embark on this very it's a type of product that requires a lot of skills and understanding the nuances of that is challenging um and you could probably use a full-time person, but at least in the early days, you can you can get a you know you can get away with just having a a, a part-time type of person, and that that was the idea. So it was helping them understand you know the product roadmap, the product architecture, you know even selecting the right partners um, on the development side or hiring a team if if that's the path that they wanted to go down. That was the idea behind it. Um, but what I quickly found, and, and I think this is maybe Michelle to to your point, my next bullet point is that immediately they wanted more. Right. So I was, you know, I was um, charging them kind of like a monthly retainer fee. And then they were like, okay, can that's great. We got the architecture and all of that, but can you actually build a prototype for us? 
um, cause we need, you know, we need it quickly and that sort of thing. And I said, yeah, fine, great. Let's do it. And so I hired a couple of full-time employees and four or five contractors and we're sort of off to the races. So in 2018, um, I had the same three clients, but we tripled our revenue. So, um, and I'll, I'm going to actually show you numbers like, and I'll tell you now. So in our first year, we did 1.3 million in revenue. And in our second year, we did $4 million in revenue. And it was with the same three clients because these are, these are large projects. They require a lot of people. And, um, and so, you know, what you'll note here is that I did zero business development. It was the same three clients. Um, and then at that point, we sort of formalized the offering. We said, okay, we're not going to be an IOT consulting company. We're really going to specialize in connected wireless medical devices. So it took us about a year to decide that we wanted to be more focused. Come 2019, um, we grew the company to five clients. So we retained the same three um, and added two more. Kind of the nature of this type of service is that it's somewhat sticky. It's pretty sticky. Like once your client's with you, they're with you for the long haul because you're their development partner. Um, we got ISO 1345 certification. Um, that's great. <clears throat> and then in 2020, um, by then we had six clients. So we retained four out of five. One of the projects we just completed and they were sort of off and didn't need us. Um, and we added two more. Um, and then by then we had a team of about 22 full-time employees and 12 to 15 contractors. So sort of. Jose, in 2020, of course, COVID hit. Yeah. Is that going to be the next slide? What happens when COVID hits? That's what I'm expecting. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I mean, so what I'm going to show you next is, is actually like our financials. So for those first three years, four years, so we went from 1.3 to 4.1 to 4.2 to 6.2. And yeah, I do think COVID played some role here. Um, and, and I think this was kind of like where I thought it was going to go because, and I do still think, by the way, that this space of connected wireless medical devices is, um, is, is kind of ripe for, for continuing to grow uh, because COVID helped knock down a lot of barriers to bringing medicine to the home um, from anything where from reimbursement to just greater comfort levels by doctors to, you know, just a lot of the technology ended up developing to, to support that. Um, but yeah, so that's, I mean, so we had a great year, like we grew by another 50%. And so as an optimistic entrepreneur, this is kind of where uh, we said, all right, this is probably where things are going, right? But but we did have a big problem that is not obvious if you're just looking at the top line. And, you know, does anybody want to say what it is? No, you relied on those three. Yeah, it's divided by customer. Client concentration, right? It's like the yeah. class thing that people tell you to be careful about. So our largest client was more than 50% of our revenue. And then um, our next largest client was about 30%. So even though we had six clients, three of them were really tiny. Like they were early, but there were small projects we had, we had done for them. Um, and two of them were really big. And even though 2020 was a pretty good year, after that, things started to soften in the fundraising space for medical device companies. Um, and one of the things that happened is that in 2021, our revenue actually dropped. And the main reason for that was kind of like the nightmare scenario. This, our largest client ran out of money. So they were out raising a large fund, a large round of, of capital. And this company raised a lot of money, like tens of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and when they went to raise their next round, they, they just couldn't. And uh, so overnight, we lost our largest client. Um, fortunately, we landed another fairly large client. Um, Jose, this yep. client took 53% that couldn't raise more money. Had they... Have they ever turned profitable? Oh, no. No. No, and medical device companies, I mean, that's- I get it, but did they ever commercialize anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the product it, the product is on the market now. Um, you know, kind of like what ended up happening with that company was they did fold, um, but then another company came in, or actually another investment group, and kind of took the assets and has rebuilt the company. And now there are clients again. <laughs> you know? but, but for a period of time there, it was tough because we had, you know, we had a good number of engineers working on it. And then overnight, like they're no longer there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it was tough and, you know, but fortunately we landed another couple of clients, but it was a little bit of a traumatic experience for us. And we said, holy crap, like we got to figure something out. There's, there's something about this that's going to be problematic to scale. The other challenge was that because the systems we develop are very sophisticated and, and require a lot of skills, um, we found that we really couldn't delegate the, the high level system level stuff. So I have two other partners, my two partners are you know really, really smart, talented guys. Um, and so we were able to grow it to a certain point, but we found, we, you know, at this point when we're here and even here, we found like, if we brought on more clients, it would be a problem. 
-hmm. because um, scaling up beyond where we had gotten um, was going to be really challenging. You know, you, you've got a lot of projects that are going on. Of course, you know, deadlines are, are always like, we need everything done tomorrow. Um, we really wanted to keep our clients happy. And so we kind of had this, this dichotomy of like, on the one hand, we want to grow. And we know that only having a handful of clients is really dangerous. On the other hand, um, we can't grow. Like if we brought on another client right now, we'd be, you know, going insane. So <clears throat> at that point, we started rethinking how we wanted to have the business and, and thinking about how we might want to do things differently to not have this client concentration problem. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But <clears throat> part of what we did was consciously decide to not take on these big, big projects anymore and to start building up kind of an arsenal of smaller projects. But, you know, one implication of that was that our revenue dropped significantly in 2022. Um, but even though that's true, and we still had one client that was large and it was a bit of a problem, you know, you can see that the rest of this pie chart was kind of starting to look more like the way we wanted it to look, which was no single client with, like our target was no client with more than 20%, but it's hard to get there overnight. So we only had one client did above you, that. Did you turn down any big opportunities in 2022? Or you just didn't chase them? A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Um, I mean, in part, we weren't chasing them as much. And then, but yeah, like there, there was a project that we looked at. And we're like, all right, this is, um, yeah, we don't want to go down this path because it's it's going to be a problem. We're going to put ourselves in the same situation. How many full-time employees did you have in 2020? Uh, 22. And in 2022? So in 2022, we did actually do a riff and we dropped to about, uh, I want to say it was like 14 or 15. So significant, because I forgot to mention, there's something else that happened here. So one of them was that we weren't, we we're making a point not to bring on these large projects. But the other thing is that this client, so, you know, the year before this, this client went out of business. In 2022, uh, this client, our new biggest one, um, canceled the project. So their, their board of directors decided that they wanted to go um, down a different, they had a product that was on the market. They were doing their next generation product. They decided they, they wanted to put that on hold. And so we had built up, you know, even, or we had transitioned some, some of the team and kind of built up a little bit more and then that got cut. So it was a combination of like pretty much experiencing the thing that people tell you is the reason you don't want to have client concentration. Um, and at the same time, kind of deliberately trying to pivot. So 22 was a tough year um, <clears throat> and it only reinforced our idea of like, you, you're going to have a hard time having long-term success if you've got a team of people and one or two projects, like losing one or two projects is, you know, is a big problem. So by 2023, uh, by then we're doing a much better job. So if you look by then, um, our largest project was now below 30. So we're kind of, the trend is going in the right direction. We're starting to have more projects, but relatively smaller um, and more stability. And then this year, you know, I've only got the revenue numbers through like August. So it looks low, but we're going to be about the same as we were last year. But, um, you know, now we're at the point where our largest client is, is about 20%. And, you know, even though, yeah, it'd be great to kind of have that going up. And, I, you know, my expectation is that we're going to grow. And this is, again, this is this number is a little bit misleading because we'll be closer to our last year revenue by the end of the year. Um, but the client concentration is looking like we want it to. So, hey, Jose, how many of those were um, repeat year over year versus oh, you finished a product, you finished a project and they moved on and you had to get a new project backfill? So, <clears throat> you know, historically we've we've um, we've always retained clients for multiple years, like two, three, four years, and and even you know this client here you know, as I mentioned, who was no longer a client in 2021, um, by 2023, I think it was, they came back and, you know, they had been, the assets had been acquired. The, the new company wanted us to be their partner. Uh, so the new executive team, um, but, but we're doing smaller projects with them. And, um, and really our focus is, is much more on software development, which I'll get to in, in a which of the colors in 2023 does the former orange box represent? I, I think it's I think it's this one or this one. It's around twenty percent. Okay, so for you, still among your largest, even though smaller. Right. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, what are kind of like the main lessons learned? And I'll 
dig into these a little bit more. So one of them is the danger of client concentration. Um, the second one is, is something that was a little bit more surprising to me. I, I just hadn't heard about it as much, but it's the, the idea that when you're a small team, having um, a very broad set of um, areas of expertise has some significant risks. You know, the third one is, is this idea of like revenue targeting strategy. It really ties in with number one. And then the fourth one's like kind of more on the positive side is how do you leverage unique assets for scalability? Um, <clears throat> so on the, you know. I'd like to pause here and have a, a, a poll and ask how many of you have ever made a conscious effort as Jose is demonstrating where you said, these are the kinds of clients um, size um, that I'm going to go for and ones that I'm going to avoid um, or are most of you like, hey, when it rains, it pours, I'll, you know, they're asking for my help, I'll take them. I see all the hands going up. I don't know if these are votes or people who want to speak. So if you have your hand raised and you'd like to speak, let me know. I know Nellie wants to speak. She always wants to speak. So it's kind of really, Jose, your story is literally what I've been, I, I literally dot for dot what you're talking about. Maybe not the money, but the timelines and what you're experiencing is what I've done in the last 10 years as well. When I first came, when I first started full-time consulting, I picked up three, four clients, no big deal. And it was like, it was like, oh, this is, there's this huge feast. And then a couple of years later, I lost half my client load. So then client concentration became a focus to me as well. And then three years later, I had personnel. We, in my company, we call them diva clients. The clients who hire, I love the term fractional. It's a new term for, I'm going to use. Hire me as a fractional, but they want a full-time employee. So it's like, you know, we call them diva clients because they're really persnickety about everything. And if you miss the one tiny thing. So your story is really resonating with me because it really goes along with that red flags presentation that I gave a couple of months ago. But I think you're looking at it more about how do you look forward versus what do you are the warning signs? Really more contributive to what Jose is saying. It's kind of like, wow, every time he's saying something, I'm like, oh, I've been there, oh, I've been there. I know what he's talking about, so. Yeah, I, I wanna say, Jose, that um, first, your approach to this presentation uh, is, uh, it touches me that you trust us to share this kind of information that you feel that we're your family. I deeply appreciate that. Um, but I also think, and I think this is probably my naivete and, and I'll let you all weigh in on this. I think that you sharing this is uh, a testament to your business savvy and it makes me more inclined to want to work with you. Um, in other words, I don't know that this would be my recommendation to you as a marketer, as your new marketing pitch. Um, but I think something like sharing, if you want to take off the numbers, that's fine, but show the bar chart and put that on LinkedIn and have this kind of conversation. I, I really think that that would be meaningful to people. Just as, you know, Nelly is like, oh my God, I can so relate. I know York can relate. Um, and I'm eager to hear what he has to say, but I really think that you're perhaps unintentionally, most likely knowing you, you're really selling yourself right now. And I applaud, I applaud transparency wherever, you know, you can. Uh, this says a lot about you, your character, your ability to lead a company, make tough decisions. And hell, your bad year is better than anything I ever saw. So it's like, you know, this guy does substantial business. He has a lot of people trusting him and riding on him. And he's, you know, a, a prolific parent. Uh, this guy is someone, to, you know, to trust. You, uh, Jorg? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks, Jose. I really appreciate you sharing this um, and being in your willingness to share it. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, we've all... I mean, everybody, you know, in my, in this business, uh, we've been through this, you know, I mean, Omnica went through this in 2009. They had a huge customer, Abbott did a huge uh, system that we developed and built and, and it was great. And, you know, it was, you know, $2 million in one year of revenue. And yeah. And then as soon as it ended, it was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was hard times for, for a while. Uh, so this is, this is very common. Um and I think it is very important to select the customers who 
A, you want to work with, B, you know, uh, you want to, um, that have problems that you want to solve that are interesting to your team, because if you don't do that over time, you tend to lose the talent that, that uh, gets you where the innovators, the people that really love being challenged, those are the people you want to keep. And if you don't give them consistent, interesting work, um, then that's a problem. Uh, getting to your your te technological mix of people, so yeah, this is uh, this is great, but but it's uh, very common and it's very hard to not do that, right? It's very hard to even today at Omnica there are times when we have clients that represent fifty percent of the revenue at a at a given point, and we go, uh oh, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> Um, that's kind of how we manage it and, uh, try, you know, we try to manage through it as opposed to, uh, intentionally not take those projects, but, um, yeah, this is, this is great stuff. So thank you. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, uh, it really brings back a, a lot of uh, details, you know, since 2003, I, when I launched my consulting practice of turning businesses around and increasing revenue. I sort of, it's beautiful to see you operationally do this, but you know, I'd start by, and I just want to share that this is a continuum of three focus areas that we as business owners could look at the sales numbers, right? So I usually start an engagement at asking the CFO to give me these numbers that you're sharing. I'll say, just fantastic how you've done it. But the impact of this is now you have the data points to one, look at who do we bring in market our business to, you know, and I would break customers down like you've got your percentages into A's, B's, and C's, right? So look at every transaction within the company, uh, say like over the last 18 months is what I used to do. And then say who, you know, I once did like, you know, one of my first clients was a company in Athens, Ohio, uh, that made spectral photometers. And they sold in 27 countries, all the major universities, NIH and stuff for the research labs. And we realized that there were certain types of universities, certain types of labs, that ordered, you know, figure out this cadence, the cycle. Because once you have this data, then you figure out what does it cost to get a client, which client is better, what are the conversions between a B, a C to a B to an A? Is it even worth the effort? The reallocation of sales staff, like so. Then, in fact, I moved the entire C level. In those cases, the people that were buying uh, spectral photometers, uh, you know, once in like five years, but there was tremendous revenue potential in customer service. Hey, do you want something else with this? Do you want training? And I literally got the sales guys off all the C's, which was like 60% of the book of business. But then we increased the transaction value of each client because now we handle them differently. We handle the C's very differently to the B's, very differently to the A's. Uh, so this data is fantastic what you've done. I love it. Uh, but I'm just saying, alluding to there's three focus areas you can actually fo uh, in work on to increase efficiencies in legion and then account management uh, and then scaling, you know, increasing the lifetime value, the annual value of account transaction, as well as the lifetime transaction value of account. Yeah. Fantastic start. Yeah. And I think Paul, I mean, part of what you're talking about is actually one of the weaknesses that I saw in our approach it might even be my next slide. Um, let me see, maybe it is. Well, yeah, this one and the next one tie in together. Like we, we became like a company that was an elephant hunter Right. And like in the sales jargon, they tell you, you might be hunting elephants, you might be hunting deer, rabbits, mice, flies. Um, and we're definitely an elephant hunter. And what I mean is like, let's say our goal was to get to $10 million in, in annual revenue. Well, you can do that in many different ways, right? So you can do five elephants at $2 million each, or you can do 50 deer at $200,000 each, or you can do 500 rabbits at $200,000 each. You can do 5,000 mice at $2,000 each. And those are all 10 million in revenue. And I would say, you know, deer, rabbits, and mice for different types of businesses and offerings makes a lot of sense. I'd say elephants are are, are really dangerous for small businesses because of the client concentration because exactly. um, you lose one and then you're in a lot of trouble. And so like where we've decided to, to focus is like, we're trying to transition. We're in the process of this. I can't, this isn't like a, Hey, look, guys, we've successfully accomplished this pivot that we're doing. This is right in the thick of it. So to be continued, we'll, we'll and I'm happy to kind of share with you guys as, as uh, things progress. But really our target now is can we land, you know, tens of clients per year where we're doing more like 200,000, you know, one to $300,000 engagements rather than landing one to two clients a year, you know, plus retaining two or three um, where we're land, you know, doing much larger engagements. And part of the challenge of, of elephants versus deer 
And so when you're hunting for elephants, it's hard to build a sales and marketing engine that can get into a rhythm. And, you know, Joe can, can attest to this because, you know, Joe was helping me with, with marketing at some point, actually probably right in that peak where part of me was like, Joe, I, I can't even take on another client right now. My, my is, yeah, like our hair's on fire and I'm not going to sacrifice, you know, the quality of service we give to our current clients. So I just can't take on any new clients. And so then what you do is you kind of shut down the marketing and sales engine. Well, you know, when one of your clients goes, goes out of business and now you need a new client, first of all, the sales cycles for elephants is long. And secondly, like if you've turned off that engine to turn it back on, you know, it sputters and it takes time and you got to, you know, go back and rebuild it. And so, so it's really tough, I think, to build a sustainable business that can grow if, if you're built in such a way that you can't get into a rhythm. So, you know, one of the reasons that we're making this transition is that, you know, we want to build kind of a sales and marketing engine. Like, you know, it's funny because, um, Michelle and I kind of have, have shared war stories in the past. And, you know, she tells me like, oh, I wish I could just do these big business. And I'm like, I wish that I just had a ton of clients like you. Like there's there's kind of pros and cons to each. But I, I really admire, you know, with Michelle, like she's out there like boom, 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 like methodical, systematic, rhythmic. Like as if there's always something going on. She's always bringing on new clients, um, you know, and and like I think that actually has a, a more sustainable, you know, clearer path. You don't probably don't get to the same level of revenue as quickly, um, but it's it's a longer term, better thing. So that's one of the big lessons that, that, you know, we've learned that we're trying to transition to. I'll let um, you at the line, Michelle, do you have a comment? Uh, uh, yes. Well, th that's funny that you said that Jose, cause that's the exact reason I had my um, hand raised is that me and you have this conversation every year. And it's like, you're going, we're, we're, we're working it from the opposite directions, which is, is just makes for a fascinating conversation between the two of us. Um, how we, we have the coming from the two different directions we have the same problems and and we have all of these metrics built in and we look at these weekly pretty much and we have a different set that we look at quarterly and and like he says it is a rhythm you have to like stay on it stay focused and like you can try some stuff and then it might be a year before that that takes in in the the way in the direction you're trying to go which I think spoke to what you you were saying on your your previous slide. Right. I almost feel like I started with elephants and you started with rabbits. Yes. And we're kind of both trying to converge to deer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Wait, there are you can Do you have something you wanted to add? Dwayne? Yeah, yeah. Um, Jose, this is fascinating. So we actually use different animals for our um, analogies. We use pigs. So I have a sister-in-law who bought a mini pig and it turned out to be a normal size pig. Um, <laughs> and when we first started our company, that's what we went after was we said, we're going to work with these really early stage companies that no one wants. And as they grow and scale, we'll be so integrated in that company that they'll become big pigs for us, right? And we just now started hunting probably at that elephant level, which for us are hospital innovation systems, accelerators, incubators. Um, but because we did that secondarily, right, we've kind of built this portfolio of work that um, you know, we constantly analyze to look at and say, all right, great. What happens when some of these pigs that are growing start to die essentially, right? So some of these companies that are growing start to die off. How do we make sure we have the other ones kind of filtered behind it? And I think that, you know, one thing that I've kind of learned, and this is why I love this presentation so far is there's so much information for startups, but for service providers that are looking to scale, it's much harder. Like unless you meet Jose, Michelle, Joe, or anyone else, you're really not going to find that out there. And so, um, you kind of transparency. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The transparency. Right. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a little difficult. So I appreciate you sharing, but, um, I think the one thing that has been helpful, at least for me so far with project MedTech, is I was able to find a core team that, you know, were, were with me from the beginning to kind of take day to day. So we can focus on, well, what's six months from now look like in a year and 18 months and those types of things. And then just sticking to the plan, I think is so crucial. Um, Cause I think you, you brought it up maybe, or, or someone did, or Joe, you asked the question um, about, you know, well, if you, do you just take work, if it's, if it's coming, you know, and it's like most of the time, yes, but there's a dangerous line with that. Uh, and if you're not always being aware of your portfolio and your clientele, um, you can get, get in trouble. Um, so anyways, the, there was a lot I wanted to comment on, but this was, this has been perfect so far. I'm, I'm curious about your pigs. Um, <laughs> do you, 
was you feel that the strategy of mini pigs growing into pigs and then they get slaughtered is um it worked for you and you feel as though now that you have this machine you can afford to try to get an elephant because you already have the inner workings to support a portfolio and if you luck out and get huge business that'll be incremental and this will stay as it is you'll so, scale so, for this and scale down for that if it goes away yeah so they don't they don't necessarily go away as long as the company still exists like you know for for our model um oftentimes we're handling the finance operations commercial strategy for the startup companies and so um as they grow, you can think of like a bell curve, right? Pre-seed, maybe less of an engagement, series A, or seed and series A, a much higher engagement. And then series B, we start to taper off because they start to hire full-time folks to replace us. Um, and so because we're oftentimes managing the finance of these companies, we have really good insight into when these things are going to, to happen. So we're not slaughtering them, we're graduating them. Well, yes. I mean, you're in the startup world. You got to take that into account that, you know, it's solid 60, 70% yep. of startups are going to fail within the few, first few years. So right. You got to. Yep. And, and, and because we're so close to them, you know, we, we, we know which ones are struggling to raise money. We know which ones have good, have real conversations. Like if you talk to any entrepreneur, you would think no startup's going to fail, but when you're sitting in the conversation with them and, and you can sit there and say, and they come to you and say, Oh, this is a white hot lead on this investor. And you could say, I was in the conversation. I promise that's not a white hot lead, <laughs> right? Um, so I think it's all about insights too and how how much insight you can get within these startups. Um, so anyways. And I, I think another difficulty with growing it from the bottom up, like like I have, is, is there's so much start and stop with these guys. Like you might get them do a regulatory pathway assessment and they go out and they hustle for sometimes years to get the funding. Then you come back, then they'll come back and then you'll do a pre-submission and then they'll go away and do their, and, and it's just like, here, here. so you got to- Michelle, are you, are you talking about me? I'm joking serious all at the same time, but Jose, following up on what Dwayne was just saying, my question is exactly this. How, how integrated are you into the planning of your clients? Because that, in my mind, would give you the, that sort of visibility of, you know, sort of the resource allocation and 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 maybe help you. You're probably you maybe you're already doing this, but uh, that to me sounds like where it would be important for you to help move up to the next level. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's actually changed. So in the early years where it was kind of a CTO type of role, I was very I was in board meetings, right? I was presenting to the board of directors of some of our clients and that sort of thing. That has its benefits, but. You know, like like the thing that Dwayne is saying is 100% true. Like any entrepreneur, and, and this is almost by necessity. If you're not the kind of person that's so optimistic that you think you're right about to close your next round of funding, you're probably not going to survive as an entrepreneur. And so you're, you know, most entrepreneurs, um, it's like they have to have a certain level of delusion. And so you, uh, unless you're in their books, which we're not, right? So that's an advantage that Dwayne has. Um, you don't, or, or you're in the investor meetings, you don't really know that kind of thing. But nonetheless, there, there's other problems. In fact, let me, you know, I'll go to the next slide and I'll show you kind of like another big problem that we saw structurally with our business that we thought, and this maybe is less relevant to you guys, but again, in the interest of transparency, we've what we've learned is for us, like skill specialization and team structure matters. And what I mean is that like, if you're a small company, you're, you're better off having depth versus breadth. So um, here's what I mean. Like with our, with our, the types of products we're doing, when we got to the point where we're about 30, 35 people, we had 21 different specialties within that because that's kind of what it takes to build a system like this. So from an operation standpoint, of course, you need some business development and operations and stuff. But then at the project level, you, know, you have a program manager and somebody who's doing quality assurance and regulatory affairs internally for us. And then sometimes even helping our clients, you know, then you've got on the hardware side, system architect, industrial designer, mechanical, manufacturing, et cetera. And then on the software side, you've got, you know, a good 10 um, different disciplines that are required to do this right. The problem with this is that you end up having mismatches sometimes. Like, you know, for a particular client, they might need a lot of your help, but what they need is, you know, uh, software and what you've got on the bench is hardware. And so even though you've got people on the bench, you still have a, a gap. You still have to go out and hire more people. So it makes it very hard, you know, and kind of the way I was thinking about this a little bit was like, if you, if you run like a small, um, what do you call it? Like a, 
like a developer or something like that, uh, like in the construction world. And you have like one plumber and one electrician and one, you know, like guy who lays bricks and one kind of thing. It's really hard to match. You're better off having four plumbers. And that's sort of what we found in our business is that it's very hard to have a large number of specialties when you don't have a huge team. And what we're targeting more is now is like, okay, we want to be in a business where we really got um, a minimum of five people in any particular specialty in the long term. Like we probably won't get there right away, but at least there's there's more of one thing rather than a bunch of different things. Um, and then all right, the last one that I'll that I'll show you guys, and then I'm, I want to pivot to something a little bit different. Is um, this is more on the positive side again? Is like finding ways to leverage unique assets for scalability. And to me, you know, scalability, even if you don't want to scale. Being in a position to scale, I think has value. I think it adds robustness to your business. So, you know, for us, that's been like moving from custom to reusable. So meaning that like, you know, right now, up until a couple of years ago, everything we're building was custom for our clients. And now we're getting to a point, and this has been a vision of ours. I know I shared this with, with uh, Joe for years, um, kind of had this vision around this product development kit where we could, you know, very quickly develop a full product, but there's certain elements of product from one to another that are just necessarily very custom. But then there's elements of it that are actually not necessarily very custom. And so, you know, for us, like what we found is that if we can build proprietary tools, they can make us like literally five to 10 X more, more efficient, which means make it a no brainer for your clients, make it tough for your com competitors. I think on the regulatory side, this is something that's regularly done, right? I mean, you guys kind of have templates and, and processes and you're sort of like, you know, if a company goes and tries to build their own QMS from scratch, it's going to take a lot more energy than if they bring on, you know, Michelle or Nelly and, you know, they've got it kind of sitting on a, on a, but it's not just like, cause it's also not helpful. I presume for a startup, you handle a bunch of templates, they don't know what to do with it. So you're, you know, the fact that it's like, you've got the know-how and you've got the system makes you way more efficient. Um, and it also allows you to, to like train your, your team, your internal team to it at, to the point where I think, I think any startup or even large company that tries to build certain things on their own, it's, it's like a terrible idea because they're, they're going to scrape their knees. They're going to like, you know, have to build up this whole organization. Um, and greater focus leads to greater expertise, greater efficiency, competitive advantage. So what that's meant for us is, um, is that we're doing this. We're going from our old offering was like, well, you know, we're, we do wireless cloud connected medical devices and we do all this stuff. So we're pivoting to saying like, we do this. So for medical device companies, we develop apps. And, and it's not just like, you know, you can't go to any app shop to do this because, you know, your regular app shop out there does not know how to do medical device software that meets the cybersecurity requirements of FDA. You know, they don't understand 62304. They don't understand, you know, all these different elements. And the way that we're offering it is like this. We're saying, we're going to start you at the 50 yard line. So we've got something that we're calling the foundation app, which says like what, you know, we've seen lots of apps. We've developed lots of apps. What are like the core features that pretty much every app out there has in medical devices? 90% of them are Bluetooth, so BLE. The, the remainder end up being Wi-Fi or, um, or cellular, but 90% are Bluetooth. So we built all of the piping, all the stuff for Bluetooth. It's very similar from one product to the next. So like why reinvent that wheel every time? User authentication, onboarding, you know, data transfer to the cloud, over the air software updates, and then making it multi-platform. Like we moved to a process where, you know, really with, with just one developer, we can build uh, iOS, Android, web, you know, desktop applications because of the way that we're doing it now. And we're leveraging all of these like internal modules that we've developed that come with all the documentation too, right? So that's, that's another kind of distinguishing factor with a regular app shop is we do this for medical. So we have all the documentation ready to go and we're not starting from scratch there either. And then with our clients, we can, you know, make it your own so we can officially customize that. So we can add things like data visualization and symptom logging and reminders and content delivery and daily task lists and gamification and adherence tracking, like all these things that again, we do see that you know, not every medical device needs, but oftentimes they do. We've developed kind of like the building blocks for it. So when they come to us, we, you know, we do the kind of foundation piece at a fixed price, and then we do all the customizations more like time and materials, but it's in a way more efficient way than if we were just building it from scratch for our clients. I just and, wrote in the yeah. chat, and I don't know that this is usable, but I stream of conscious, how I restructured my company and how you benefit. This is a really... You're, you're you're very impressive. This is a very impressive, analytical, thoughtful approach to business, and uh, it's it feels very compelling for a customer. I I don't know how you might choose to 
crypto. I, I disagree. I think this is way too open kimono for public consumption. I, I know that I would use it. Way. I would use this as saying, as spending it more like, are you my ideal customer? Here are the check boxes. If you need these things, we are mm, great. That's about you and not about them. Are you my ideal customer? I don't care. Well, I don't think, I don't think that this is appropriate to share with a client. Does everyone agree with, I, I suspect they do. Does everyone agree with Michelle? Everyone yes. agrees with Michelle. I, I, I don't agree with Michelle. I actually think it should be a case by case basis because like I said, I have clients that we're really like more than just 52 cards on the table. That relationship is so transparent because it's such a fabulous relationship. And then like my diva clients, I would never share this with my diva clients because this just oh, gives part of this. Are we talking about the part where you shared numbers? Yeah. I, yeah. To this company? Yeah. I would, to be honest with you, my diva clients, I give them very little to criticize. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Michelle was, was it the money part in the beginning? or this, these last three slides? Well, I don't know that how he structured and grew his business is relevant to my understanding that he's competent to provide the, serv the services that I need. Fair enough. Like, good job, you're a good business person. But what, where, where does that get me down the road and getting my product? Well, actually, the well, well, answer would be- I, I, I see the last three slides as, I mean, that's your pitch. That's your new pitch to- to clients, and I think it's compelling. Clients want fat; they want speed, they want I fixed think, cost, even especially the first phase. So I, I think this is actually. But that's very not good. pitching that you're good at running your company or reorganizing your company or focusing. I think like this slide right here is, is great, but this has, this is where he's ended up. But if that's not necessarily relevant to the data that we were looking at earlier in this presentation. Yeah, I no, think I think the last three the slides is marketing. the last three slides is really the. <clears throat> the pitch, the previous stuff is <clears throat> why did the pitch? I think, I think, you know, just the sort of um, kind of in the middle is, is what I see is I think there's probably like a content piece maybe that, that comes out of like the, the initial part of it that is interesting to people. And I agree. Like, I, I mean, the way we're looking at it is kind of our next phase of pitch is really telling people like, first of all, you'd be, a, you'd be really unwise. It's too confusing at, at a glance. I understand it, but it's you know, too much the story. The story behind it is like, you'd be unwise to try to do this whole thing on your own. And if you find a partner who says they're going to do all of this and they, that they're going to do it well, they're probably full of shit. Like very few can do all of this well. Um, you're better off like finding a partner to do this and then finding a partner to do this. And like we're world-class specialists. We do it every time. And here's like the benefits that you're going to get. That's kind of the gist of, of where we're going to go with the pitch. We're, we haven't, we're actually doing a new website and stuff. Um, but I know here we got two minutes. So let, let me wrap up kind of like what we're seeing is our new business strategy. And these are, some of these are just hypotheses right now. Like, you know, as I said earlier, I'll report back in a year and let you know how it went. But we're thinking like this should be a huge value to our clients because it will be lower cost. It will be faster time to market and it's going to be better, better apps, even than we've done in the past, which, you know, pretty proud of what we've done in the past, but it's going to be even better. Um, everything's going to be secure. They're all going to be compliant, you know, beautiful, robust because, we're not building something new each time, you know, and kind of missing the gaps. We're, we're building on something that's already proven and established, and we're just sort of like incrementally improving on it. Um, I think it's going to be a lot easier to partner, you know, so I think there's there's companies out there that really don't specialize in apps and either they just don't want to do them. I think that's the smart ones. And so it's like, we can come in and be partners with them. Whereas before it was harder because we're somewhat competitive. Like if we go to a company that does like great medical device, mechanical engineering, and we also offer mechanical engineering, there's going to be an apprehension there. So what I'm hoping is that a lot of those companies that specialize in medical device, mechanical, even electronics, just the hardware side of it, will see us as like a glove in hand partner. And together we can go out and land clients. You know, the third one for us is like, we're going to have a lot fewer specialists, which makes it easier to scale. So rather than like maybe 19 different specialties per project, um, the way we structured it, we can probably do a really good job with four specialists per project. And then kind of one or two people that are sort of, you know, sprinkling um, knowledge where needed. And then, you know, of course, the goal is to reduce client concentration. Um, and then finally, we think it's going to be easier to build a sales and marketing machine because, as I said earlier, we're going to be able to kind of get into this rhythm and, and really build out a, a full machine, like not just, hey, when we need clients, I'm out there hustling. It's going to be more like, you know, we've got like a consistent, you know, content strategy and sales and like whatever. So that's that's the summary of what we're hoping for. Um, and I'll let you know, I'll let you guys know how it goes. Okay. I just added some things in the chat, my feedback. Yeah, please, Patricia. 
Oh, I wrote it in the chat. I was thinking that the um, I do appreciate this transparency. Thank you. It's really interesting. It helps uh, us as a group as well, some of us. Um, but the first slides um, where you're talking about your like the details of the money, I would use that for investors or clients that ask for a follow up. Or sometimes uh, in the RFP section, there'll be a, is your is your business sustainable um, question? I would ask that. Otherwise, I, I agree with uh, the fact that maybe you don't want to have so much transparency for the high maintenance ones that just are overly critical. Um, but having bar graphs and like less details of the money might be helpful for some RFPs. And I apologize for the kittens, their rescues that I help on Friday mornings. That's why my camera's not on right now. It's all good. Thank you for participating. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Jose, this was, uh, this was great. Um, kudos on the depth and the template aspect of it as well. Uh, that's something we focused on um, a ton. And eventually, you know, it makes it like, I know for us, our pro forma was our big thing, right? And now so many investors are so used to seeing our pro forma that it makes it something that startups can't essentially live without, right? Which which is always a good position to be in. Um, the depth is another area I think is hypercritical. Like we just started expanding um, because we were referring so much work out for different things that it was like, what are we doing here? Let's take that in-house, right? Um, I think the one thing, when you think about like how to integrate this into marketing, the one place startups have a huge pain point is understanding how people they're working with are incentivized. Um, and if you can explain to them that you, how you're incentivized is also the to the benefit of how um, uh, they are incentivized, then you have something there. Like I know accelerators, incubators struggle with this because they're incentivized to create jobs, right? And it's like, they're not incentivized for you to be successful. For us, what we've used, and it's been pretty transparent, is for those pre-seed companies, we are incentivized to, for them to be successful because if they are successful, then they will spend more money with us. And oftentimes we will tell them that. And with the pre-seed companies we're working with, it's like, yeah, we want to get you fully prepared to raise your seed and series A round because we know that if we create enough value in this engagement, in this pre-seed round, you are going to spend more money with us. There's no question about it. Um, and we're going to help you get to that series B and then we'll graduate you off. We'll stay on. Oftentimes, maybe we might take some equity at that point um, and, and they're out. But I think being transparent about how you're incentivized and if it matches there, you know, how, how, how like their success route, that's super critical. And I think that in, in our experience, startups have appreciated the transparency there. Great. Okay. We appreciate you so much. I, I really feel like represent everyone when we say that. Uh, next week, I think it'll be fun at a minimum uh, and exciting for any of you who are even ambiently aware of um, what happened with CrowdStrike a few weeks back and how it shut down airlines and the like. Um, our friends from MedCrypt are going to be our guests next week, and they're going to talk about specifically cybersecurity, make sure Mr. Pistachio is around, um, and uh, how it could, something, an event like that might bite you in ways you did not expect. So uh, that's next week, and I'll see you then. Jose, thank you very much. Have a great week, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye for now. Thank you.